Am I beautiful? Yes. Okay, I'm ready. Have you ever had a bad day at work? I know I have. Phineas Gage was a railroad foreman that had a far worse day than you or I because in September of 1848, he blew a three-foot metal rod right through his brain. It landed 80 feet away. When he got to the doctor, he threw up and part of his brain fell out of the top of his head. So then he died, right? Nope. Hello Neuronauts, today we are going to continue our discussion about the history of neuroscience in the modern period. This is the second part that focuses just on the modern period, and there will be one more part about the modern period right after this. Subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss the next part. Now let's get back to what you really want to hear about. Phineas Gage the Railroad Man. On September 13th, 1848, Gage was directing a group of men to blow up rocks so they could lay railroad tracks. To make the rocks go kaboom, you first had to drill a hole, fill it with explosive powder, add some sand or clay, and then pack it down with a metal rod. Can you see where that might go wrong? Around 4.30 p.m., Phineas Gage was packing down the explosives with the metal rod when the explosives went boom. The metal rod he was using shot out of the hole, through the bottom of his jaw, behind his left eye, and then came out the left side of his head. The 13-pound, 3-foot metal rod landed 80 feet away, covered in blood and brain. According to the people that were there, Gage was thrown back, thrashed violently for a bit, but after a few minutes he could talk and walk with a little bit of help. Eventually, I'm going to make a video that covers that story in way more detail, but for now, let's just say that he lost a really big chunk of his left frontal brain. The doctor who took over his case, Dr. John Martin Harlow, recorded the entire thing, and Phineas Gage's story became a really important case study in neuroscience for damage to the prefrontal cortex and executive function. In 1861, a doctor named Pierre Paul Broca heard about another interesting patient at a hospital. This patient, over the course of 21 years, had slowly lost the ability to speak, but did not lose the ability to understand things or mentally function. Once this patient had died and Broca could perform an autopsy, he noticed that there was a severe lesion to the left side of the patient's brain. A neurologist named Mark Dax had discovered the connection between the left side of the brain and speech almost a generation earlier. However, after performing 12 similar autopsies, Broca got a small part of the left side of the brain named after himself. A little area here in the left frontal lobe that handles speech production was named Broca's area. Karl Wernicke, a German scientist, also helped us to understand speech production and comprehension in the brain around this time. Wernicke's area is posterior to Broca's area, just a little bit behind it, and it handles speech comprehension and getting the right words out when you want to make a sentence. In the 1870s, an English doctor named John Hewlings Jackson performed studies on epileptic patients, patients who have seizures. From these studies, he was able to map out the motor cortex. The motor cortex is the part of your brain that helps you control movement. So when you hear motor in neuroscience, think, movement. In 1875, another English doctor named Richard Caton published his findings about electrical activity in the brains of rabbits and monkeys. Soon after, a German doctor named Hermann Monk discovered that vision was processed in the occipital lobe on the back of the brain in 1878. In 1909, American neurosurgeon Harvey Cushing discovered that the sense of touch is processed in the postcentral gyrus. As you can see, neuroscientists all over the world started assigning functions to parts of the brain in the 1800s, leading to a revolution in neuroscience. Neuroscientists needed a map so they wouldn't get lost talking about all these different parts of the brain. So in the early 1900s, a man named Corbinian Broadman split the brain into 52 regions that he called Broadman areas. His map was based on anatomical structure and cell histology, the type and distribution of cells. Tissues with a particular cell histology and structure were given their own area. To this day, neuroscientists and neuropsychologists still use Broadman areas sometimes to find our way around the brain. 
That's it for this video, but in the next one, we'll be finishing our discussion of the modern period. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell so you can figure out when I make new videos. Take care of your brains, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.